um, uh, teenagers that said to us, you know, we don't fit. We, we were having a hard time fitting into a church as a family. And finally, our 16-year-old son said to Ross, um, Dad, you need to preach. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ross's response, because he was working full-time in his family business, was, I'm not going to do it alone. Uh, we're gonna, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it as a family. And the kids took the challenge very serious. And um, so they, you know, one started off in kids ministry and one started off with the worship team. And, uh, and so between Ross and I, we had kind of understood how each other flowed well. And so Ross could take a few minutes in a little while and share like how he attacked how do you plant in rural America? But for me, um, it was deep in my bones what small town America valued. I knew that what was going to win them was going to be, you know, our trump card was God had given us a huge heart for our character. And we knew that that was something that small town America really respected yet and so if if professionals were moving to small town america it was because they valued some of those traits that um it was okay that we brought up god in different places whether it was at the hospital or whether it was in the school and so we knew some of that foundational stuff was still there that people were returning to small town america for those old fashioned values. And that was something that God had already worked in us. And so for one of the things that we had to do was to relocate, since we had four kids in public school, we locate, relocated right on a school road so that everybody could look in our windows and go, oh, that's that Nelson family that moved back to Tomahawk. And it was amazing how many people said, we just wondered every night what you were doing and could we come in and it looks like they were having fun. And, and so location for us was really huge that um, we needed to be so that the people could look inside of our life for a, sm a small amount of time until we could really get established. Um, once, once they knew who we were, then they they felt safe, but um, it was like um, what did I I had put today? Um, they they just needed people to verify that we were legitimate, and so we got involved in the schools and stuff like that. And that was kind of our our uh, our initial thoughts: is if we're going to do this, people need to know who we are. Mm. That's that's what's for us. That's what small town wants to know. Do you pay your bills and and do you shop locally? All those things. Like, do you support Tomahawk, mm. um, or or is or are you too good for Tomahawk? And and so we needed to to be in every checkout aisle that we could in our local area and say we believe in you. Mm. Mm. And, and Mary, um, if I remember right, uh, my geography and, and stuff, Elgin was more, it's more of a suburb metro area of Chicago, yes. is that right? And, yes. And I'm Double. guessing everything you just said about buying local and people watching you and looking at your home, and all, I'm guessing that wasn't a part of that experience at all. None of that None. mattered. No. 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 No one would ever remember, well... No, that, that's not very, true. Very, very few remembered. Like, we did have one favorite grocery store, but, um, you know, that's unique. And that was because we did that very purposefully, you know, in Elgin. But it was like, it was hard to make any kind of impact like that when you lived in suburbia, mm -hmm. um, relationally, in that in that way. Mm -hmm. So, so what yeah. I Oh, go ahead, Ross. Missionally, yeah, missionally uh, in small town when we moved up here, I um, worked in my family's business, which was a grocery store, and uh, I 
youngest brother was overseeing the store. Um, I led him to Christ a number of years um, previously. And so he, he gave me um, just free reign at the store to um, share my faith with whomever, whatever. Um, it, but the neat thing about that particular business um, in this small town, our town's 3,500 people, and uh, about two thirds of the community would go through that store in a given week. And so, you know, I purposely had myself there where, you know, my face was out in the community. I was witnessing the people. I led people to Christ in the frozen aisle in front of the cheese. And, uh, you know, um, actually that's where a lot of our converts happen was right there in a supermarket. Uh, so I recommend people who are going to be planting in small towns that they get into a, a business that, you know, they can see a large percentage of the community in a given week or a given month, you know. Um, so that was very strategic, um, you know, and, and was a real asset for um, the establishment of our of our church. So, um, yeah, and in a small town, uh, too, is that the face of the pastor or the face of the um, planting family has to be in the community. Um, you know, and so not only do we no longer homeschool our kids, but we put them in public schools. Um, I coached ice hockey. Um, so I was out in the community, um, and also helped out with uh, baseball. I've never played baseball in my life, but I helped, you know, with that, shake the balls or whatever, just to be out, uh, amongst, uh, the people there. So, and to, and to show that you were a dad too. Yeah. To show yeah. that I was a dad, a real dad and that, you know, I didn't, you know, um, you know, I wasn't sitting down in a local tavern, drop my kid off at baseball and then go pick him up, you know, afterwards or whatever. Uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, and I don't have any problem about the local taverns because we go in the local taverns too. Oh uh, yeah. It's in small towns. That's, that's your social setting. Sure. Uh, it's kind of a gathering place. And so it's another place where you have a, a pool of people that you can connect with and stuff. So I've been with you on enough trips, Ross. I know you don't have a problem with taverns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in Northern Wisconsin, you, you can't have a problem with taverns. That's no. what, so. <laughs> I, I'm interested. Um, uh, you said that like at the grocery store, you present the gospel and you let a lot of people to Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, was was your presentation the same as it would have been in Elgin on a one on one basis? Did you find? I mean, you've had to contextualize so many other things towards small town. Was is there any difference in the way you contextualize the good news? The, as, as yeah, you I you know, um, it was like super low key. Like um, I would see someone who would have a need; they'd either look sad or whatever, and. I'd strike up a conversation with them and soon things um, came into uh, a spiritual discussion and um, and then I it was just a natural flow where you know I, I just says hey if you want peace uh, in this situation you'll need Jesus and then basically they'll just say well how how does that happen you know and so <laughs> you know I, it's just I keep it I kept it really low-key and simple and um and just like real natural i didn't you know ask to lay hands on or anything like that and i i says could i pray for you right now and stuff and uh you know and people would start crying and you know and re receive christ and then they'd start coming coming to our church so yeah. it, it was uh pretty laid back and uh, and people in small town i think really like laid back stuff uh, approach so um, the thing that I liked is because we were starting all over, um, we got to figure out what we could do better. And one of the things that was really cool is I come from a great big Roman Catholic family. There's 12 of us. And a couple of my siblings were interested in coming, but um, they, they would school me kind of what was what wasn't effective for them coming from kind of a Catholic Lutheran background. And we realized we had been doing ministry for probably what, 20 years by then. And so making it more um, relational based mm. and um, 
not trying to break down churchy words that we had been using and helping them talk to share their faith, our faith more simply with them and how, how well they responded to the gospel when it wasn't religious or it wasn't, um, Christianese. Yeah. Yeah. It had just kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity to do things a little better. How do, mm -hmm. how about if I say it that way? Sure. Yeah. Well, so on one hand, you're, you're, you're making it more simple. You're, you're breaking it down for them, making it more relational, less, like you said, churchy or Christianese. I'm wondering how did they respond? Cause so many small towns, the only expression of Christianity they've had is, is pretty traditional expression. Uh -huh. Um, how did they respond to a contemporary uh, version of, of, of Christian yeah. worship? Well, um, what a, Oh, like the worship part? Well, or just uh, the, the oh, contemporary it. expression. Yeah, the whole deal. Yeah, well, one of it was whenever, like, especially whenever I preach, I love telling stories about what my heritage in the Catholic Church, mm. what, the richness that I was able to glean and hold on to. And so, you know, like the scripture says, you know, whatever is good and pure and honorable, think on these things. So those are the things the Lord had me do was to really honor our background. And we both really, with Ross coming from a Lutheran background, we both really have learned to tell our story, honoring our, our upbringing. Mm. And, and the, the whole community pretty well knows that we have no intent of slandering the other churches in town. And they could always see in the bulletin that we would be praying for the, every church in our community each day. Every church was on our prayer list. Um, we would divide it up so that, you know, on Monday it was one church and Tuesday it was another. And, and so they got that sense of community um, from us. And then Ross started going to the ecumenical uh, pastors um, meeting and we would do some joint services you know we, we've tried different things over the years to yeah. connect with them yeah and as a result of that um, of connecting with the other churches I mean we um, birthed a quite a few different ministries in the in the small town here um, one is the homeless ministry we just uh, started um, um, a um, a home actually the catholic church had an old nunnery behind the the uh their their church building and uh they donated that um to our homeless ministry for a, a buck a year for the next 40 years or whatever or something ridiculous we remodeled it and now it's it uh, it's full blown it's functional and everything like that and so we're taking care of homeless people in lincoln county now through that uh, we brought in actually the Salvation Army uh, through that um, group of churches uh, functioning together. And so we do a number of things uh, through that organization. Uh, we started a soup kitchen. Um, we started a, a volunteer organization for uh, elderly people. Uh, there, so there's a lot of things when the churches in small town cooperate with each other um, that, um, you know, those things can and can come to the forefront and, mm -hmm. and be very fruitful. Yeah, we do backpacks for the kids that don't have enough food on, on the, the weekends. weekends, and that's all ecumenical. Mm, that's so, cool. Yeah. So it's not just the vineyards doing this. It no. is the body of Christ. Right. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we go much deeper, I do want to say um, it, you, there is a Q and A section to uh, to our webinar. So if you have a question, you're listening in on this, um, uh, go ahead and just shoot a question. I'll, I'll get to it. I'm kind of a, a one man show right now, so it might take me a couple minutes as I'm running some other stuff here. But uh, uh, we'll definitely work in your questions. And uh, here in just a few moments. We're going to get into some specific questions that people posted to us via Facebook uh, earlier um, the last couple of days. So, but I did want to let you know if you're listening right now and some things are prompting, uh, you're prompting some questions, or if we're not scratching the right itch, please send us questions. We want to talk about the part of mission and contextualization that 
that attracted you to this webinar. And uh, so please um, send us your questions and we'll get to those. Um, I want to, I want to dig in just a little deeper here on um, how, how did you contextualize doing church? Um, and we don't have time probably to do all of these, but things like discipleship or small groups or outreach or even the services themselves. Um, you did, you did big city church in Elgin. Um, and, and now you're starting over, um, uh, over in Tomahawk uh, quite a few years ago. And how did you have to change what, what looked different? Um, how did you contextualize this for your town? Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things um, that we had to do, though, is we had to check out, uh, you know, just kind of the spiritual atmosphere of town, you know, uh, what type of churches were available and that sort of thing. Um, and then that determined uh, what kind of expression, you know, our worship would take. Um, it was you know, pretty, you know, laid back acoustic initially, um, uh, a bit of a country uh, twang to it, if you will. Um, and then, uh, the, uh, type of preaching, I did expository preaching. I went through the gospel of John initially. I think it took two years to do that. Uh, and the reason, uh, why we went in such a slow pace, because we discovered that people were basically biblically illiterate coming from, uh, especially if they came from a traditional church background. Um, so we were really careful of doing, you know, just some really solid explanation and teaching and stuff. Everything we did, we we were careful to explain things. Like when we did communion, um, I would emphasize, you know, what we were doing here. What's the significance of it and stuff instead of just saying, okay, we're going to have communion, say the words from the Gospel of Matthew, and then just go ahead and participate. And what happened was is, is that people – didn't realize the the rich, deep meaning behind uh, each one of those aspects uh, of the worship service. And so uh, we just took the time to explain those things, and people really, really appreciated that. And it was a much more rich experience, and God still showed up on it. You know, it's, Mm. you know, um, so that we we were very intentional about that. Um, Also, the way we did our service, uh, we were pretty low-key. Um, you know, uh, what we did, we kept it safe. We, we, in fact, right up front, we told people that we want to keep this, this service safe so that you can invite other, uh, people who would be interested in knowing about Jesus to the service. And And that, that would probably be a change from our Elgin community to Tomahawk, um, Elgin had a little more expressive worship and when we initially planted we knew that it would get a label immediately in small town america okay Mm -hmm. and we had to figure out what type of label we wanted to start with we could grow it but if it was going to be if if we were going to be as husband and wife and our children if we were going to be really expressive immediately it was going to have a label of being a charismatic church and that would be a label that would be really, really long-term, hard to get rid of. In small town. Yep. So we waited almost a year before we were really expressive with our worship until we had a, a group of probably between 75 and 100 where uh, the identity was already kind of established that it was, um, I mean, it had a lot of other labels besides just, oh, it's a charismatic, another charismatic church. Mm. And so we knew that kind of starting out that, um, that it wasn't going to be a long-term thing, but that we had to get it off as um, we just wanted people to, to be creative with how they were going to describe us and not just put it in one little simple box. And that turned out to be really effective. Because the worship team, we never said to them, um, you know, we never asked them to uh, restrict themselves in any way. But Mm. just Ross and I did for that period of time. And um, I think that was beneficial. So, And then in terms of outreach, you mentioned about outreach. Um, uh, 
what I did was, um, and, and this was part of the initial DNA of the church, that we're going to be servants to the community. Uh, so one of the very practical things that um, I did is I went and offered my services uh, to the local funeral homes. Uh, and I just said, if, if any of you guys have a family that uh, doesn't have a pastor that would like to have a pastor, please call me. Um, I will meet with the family. Uh, and do the best they can to accommodate them and in, uh, in their time of grief and stuff. And that's worked out really, really well. Um, the yes. other thing that we did really intentional uh, in terms of serving the community um, is, is that, you know, we get, got involved in uh, children's activities uh, in the community as well as elderly um, things, you know, nursing homes and, and, and other things as well. And what we found in a smaller town, if you take care of the kids and the elderly, everybody is, is in love with you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they're go, oh, here's a church who really cares. And, you know, they're reaching out to those two groups in the community that some people just say, well, uh, golly, it's going to take a lot of time and energy to work with kids or the elderly really don't count anymore. Let's just, you know, leave them over there in their corner in the nursing home or whatever. So we were very, very intentional uh, about that, and that, that paid, um, paid some really good dividends uh, in terms of uh, winning favor with the schools, winning favor with the nursing homes, uh, even the hospital. Um, you know, so those are things that we did very, very intentional in outreach. Now, now some, of the, some of the outreaches we say, you, oh, go ahead, Joe. I was just saying. Now, it was that was that a different strategy than when you two had ministered in bigger towns? I mean, the intentional part of children, yeah. elderly funeral homes, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in Elgin, uh, we were right downtown Elgin, so we were dealing with gangbangers. Uh, we were dealing with um, boy, a, Home, a lot of a homeless. homeless people. Um, it was a total different strategy, and so. You know, the way we did church. That was racial reconciliation. Ra yeah, we did different okay. ethnic diversity. Yeah, we did. Uh, it was a, it took, yeah, it was a total different uh, emphasis or emphases uh, at the Elgin Vineyard compared to, uh, to here. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. yeah. One of the things um, that I think that we do quite well also is that touch that, when you're in a small community, uh, you get the privilege of knowing them um, on many different levels. You probably know where well, most of your congregation works. Uh, you know their kids in school and stuff. And so like our communion time is, is a very special time where we get the privilege of knowing like usually who's pregnant and being able to pray for them. You know them by name. And so there's more contact with touch and, and care that you might not have necessarily in a real big community. Um, you might know more information, and so you might have the ability to be more relational. That's so, cool. Yeah. Um, so that was a plus. Um, you know, the other thing that we were able to do is um, – there was a huge need in our community to love on the adults with disabilities. And so for the past eight years, that was a ministry that we have developed uh, into a full um, a monthly small group, continuing to reach out. We do full meals and um, oh, uh, birthdays. Tea, yeah, I get to preach for that one. That's really fun. But we do Christmas parties. Everybody gets a birthday party. And we do dances, uh, picnics in the park, and they look forward to that every single month. And um, that is a huge team that provides that. Almost as many as there's like between 28 and 35 adults with disabilities that come. And it takes probably 20 to run that, that monthly outreach. How awesome is that? Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, and so I think in small town, if you look at the people who are kind of left out, the, the fringe people, um, you know, if you if you bless them and take care of them, um, I tell you what, word gets around real. It'll be on the local radio, you know, the next day or the next week, yeah. or in the local newspaper, which comes out once a week. Some of you'll be yakking about it, and it just gets, you know, a lot of mileage right away. So that's super cool.
Mm-hmm. Well, we're talking about missiology and contextualizing church and church planting in small town uh, USA. I want to remind you, if you have any questions, go ahead and send uh, to me through the Q and A. Um, Tanya, I want to apologize. I saw your hand was raised, and uh, I'm learning this new software. It's our first time using this particular software, and I cannot figure out how to uh, acknowledge you. So I'm doing it verbally right now. So if you have a question or a comment, feel free to hit the Q&A button and, and send it to me, and uh, we'll, we'll get you on there. Um, real quick, before we continue, just do a couple uh, brief announcements, kind of take a little uh, come up from air here from this great conversation. Um if you know anybody in central California, a small town is going to be over there doing a seminar March 12th, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in San Luis Obispo and a couple hours north of uh, L.A. and uh, uh, going to be meeting with uh, vineyard pastors there, many of whom are bivocational. They're going to be talking about how to partner, how to do triads, uh, how to partner up and do uh, churches, church planting together. And... Um, I know the Northern Wisconsin triad is, is doing gangbusters and, and is just uh, um, got, I don't know, 20 some people in their, their residency in several cities that they're targeting, small towns are targeting, and it's all happened because of triads. I know I'm in a partnership and uh, a church is planted in a small county seat um, east of here that would not be there unless uh, a couple vineyards partnered together. So we'll be talking about that in California. And then in May, May 19th through 21st here in Lancaster, um, we'll be doing our small town USA church planting conference and not only a church planting, but just doing church and pastoring and planting in small town USA. Um, we're blessed to have uh, Phil Strout as a keynote speaker at that, uh, followed by, uh, practitioners, uh, men and women who are actually doing this in small towns and uh, I'll be hitting the EDLD stuff of evangelism, discipleship, leadership development and diversity and how to do that in small town. Uh, the price is $75 and that includes your Friday meals, breakfast, lunch and dinner, as well as Saturday morning breakfast. And we'll have breakout groups during those meals. So people who are kind of in an affinity group, you know, multi-sites could meet for breakfast or those kind of things. Uh, uh, people who are bivocational can meet together and we'll have breakout groups during the meals and trying to keep it as economical as possible. We'll also have a limited number of host homes if anybody needs uh, some help that way too. So uh, registration details and the registration actually link and stuff will be coming out next week. You can go to smalltownvineyard.com next week, or you could look on multiplyvineyard.org uh, and look at our partnership page to find that. So I want to jump into some of these uh, questions here that we have. And um, these are ones that came from Facebook. These are uh, men and women who are actually on this webinar right now. They're, they're uh, participants right now. I saw on there and uh, they had some of these questions. One of the questions was so much of small town and rural America is being crushed by economic pressures due to globalization. How do you speak to a population that has vastly different economic prospects than church plants in suburbs and in metro areas? Uh, how have you had to, to speak to them differently, tailor your, your message differently? Um, well, we certainly offer a financial class and we do talk really honestly about um, living, you know, and we try to teach by example um, as far as living within your means. And, um, and so Tomahawk has been <laughs> affected, you know, and, uh, but it's very interesting also for us, what's really different is the political scene here um, is a lot different than in Elgin. And so for learn, learn us, being teachable for uh, diversity within the political realm and stuff, and uh, that affects our paper mills and our uh, Harley Davidson and all that. So it has been a stretch for us to um, to stay um, open to uh, all different people's um, you know different thoughts and ideas on it and how they express that with their Christianity. And that's really diverse. So the economic effects are um, our congregation. 
quite a bit, but we do have most people in Tomahawk employed. So okay. we're very fortunate. Because of some of the factories and stuff that you yeah. have. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it was a bubble. We we weren't affected by the 08 crash as much as some other areas and stuff. So, yeah. uh, which was, you know, which was a, a, a godsend. But one of the things we, we do is um, we, we just foster in the congregation from day one, a, a sense of generosity that um, any monies that we brought in from day one, we tithe. Okay. And uh, initially what we did is uh, we helped out either needy families in the, in the community, um, you know, in, in that sort of thing. So we had money set aside and we were right up front that as a congregation, we were going to function corporately with that. And so we were going to um, be givers. We're going to be a church that we're going to be givers, um, you know, right, right at the get go. And, and that created just a, a spirit of generosity, even with the people who um, have lesser means, um, you know, they, they still give. And they might not be able to give uh, the way that um, uh, other people who are well off, but nonetheless, uh, because there is that atmosphere generated, um, th there's still the giving. They can still do something. Um, and what we do with our outreaches too is we have multiple entry places for each one of our outreaches and so let's say someone who is not uh, less financially uh, fit to um, help out with a particular uh, outreach well they can come and they can um, you know serve in another capacity that helps launch that outreach and we look at that as uh, just as much as value as people who might have plunked down a thousand dollars for the outreach or whatever. So we try to create a community atmosphere uh, and get everybody on board that, you know, everyone gets involved, um, uh, you know, re regardless of their uh, economic status. And it's been real effective. So. Michael Hull brought up something. He, he texted a, a question here just of, of that in small towns there there is a lot of economic um diversity so for instance in suburbia uh, you may have um pretty monolithic or pretty close in a in a suburban church of fairly middle class to maybe upper middle class to upper class uh you know folks coming but i imagine in small town you you all are your church is made up of people that are probably well below the poverty line to perhaps the town eye doctor and dentist you know I mean speak to that a little bit yeah um, that was a real growing curve for us because our greeters you're gonna know if someone walks in if they're the local doctor or if they're the local dentist you're also gonna know if the person the girl that walked in was um, out last night at a bar uh, making bad choices. And so we got to learn as a group, do we treat every single person that walks in the door with mm. total respect mm. and that, that we show as much um, love for the doctor as we do for the girl that was out last night. And um, that coming from Elgin, one of the things Ross and I realized is we were actually more comfortable working with the poor than working with people that God brought in that we probably guessed had money, but we were insecure in ourselves. And so we didn't look them eyeball to eyeball and, and think that they could, um, fit in our church and feel comfortable with us. And so Tomahawk, we got to start over and go, if God brought them here, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so to, to build up our own confidence and shake hands um, with, with total respect that this man and this woman, they all need Jesus just like we do. And so I think that was, once we got over that hump and we learned how to do it, then everyone followed us like, oh, everyone gets loved in this church. 
There's mm. no partiality. There's no uh, indifference. And so I think as in a small town, the pastor it has to model that, mm. you know? That's great. I, we're, we're getting some good questions in here that I want to, I want to get in on. Um, Pat and Jenny Schultz um, ask. <laughs> we know them. Oh, you know them? Okay. <laughs> so is this a softball question that they're lobbing to you? Or no. Are they going no. to get you with the hardball? <laughs> we'll see here. Um, what are some obstacles you encounter in small towns in getting folks to join you um, because you're the new unknown church in town? Um, are the obstacles greater if you don't have roots in that town? Um, we couldn't really answer that one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think uh, we can because we we do have some roots in this town. So I I don't know if we could fairly um, answer that. Um, uh, my I, I just think if you love on people in small town though um, that you you get in quicker, uh, you get into the inner circles quicker, um, and so if you're real, uh, if you're not you know, religious, phony, if you're just real, everyday person, and just, you know, love on them, love on their kids, uh, you'll win their hearts, and, you know, they will they will accept you. Now, we do know that in small town, though, too, that um, you, you will have to, in Midwest particularly, you will have to have, you know, eventually have a building with your shingle out there. Otherwise, they'll look at you like a cult. So, you know, meeting... Uh, you know, like in a home and stuff like that. I mean, the phenomenon we ran into is um, we invited lots and lots of people and they wouldn't come to our home, but they said, the moment you get into a public building, we will come. And so when we made that transition, we went from 30 in the house. And when we made the transition to meeting the Episcopal church, we went to 55 in one Sunday. So we almost doubled just because we had a building, you know, looked yeah. like we had a building, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's in the Midwest, that's uh, something you gotta be aware Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Yeah. My experience, uh, Pat and Jenny has been that, uh, it, it takes longer if you're not from the town, uh, to gather, to get steam going. I mean, you can do things to accelerate it, like be involved in the school and stuff. But my first church plant, I was in a small town. I was not part of the, um, uh, the town, but we had a, I was an associate pastor with that team and, uh, we had like 20 people on our core team when we started. And, um, I was the only one, my wife and I were the only ones not from the town. So we were able to ride the coattails of everybody else. Yeah. Uh, but had we been coming in blind, it, in fact, there was another church plant, a Nazarene church plant in that. And it was a great guy. Um, but he was not from the town and he just could not get traction because of that. I think it takes longer. We're seeing that in the, we are doing a, we're part of a partnership doing kind of a satellite church plant, quasi, whatever, something in the County East of here. And the uh, same thing when it was just a satellite with kind of the outside group doing preview services, no traction. We went to weekly services, but we turned loose local leaders and, immediately a core team was got uh was was put together and it and it's you know nine weeks in they're averaging you know, you know 47 people um just because i think of local of local leadership so it takes a little a little time there so um but the lord will provide those you know he yeah really will provide those yeah michael who makes a good point he just texted and said you know one of the biggest challenges is having a um a building you know, um, in small town USA. And on the one hand, you might be able to find stuff that's uh, lower priced if there's stuff available. You know, that's part of the thing. Is there anything available that could even house a church? If it is, perhaps it'd be lower priced. But it's still a big challenge. How do you get the money for it? But then he said he would double the time of, of putting something together, um, if not from that area, that it's just a little slower, you know, pace. Uh, mm -hmm to be well known and to be accepted and to, are you just fly by night? Are you just coming in leaving? Or are you going to be here for the long haul? Mm -hmm. Gerald sheets asked some good questions. He said, uh, could you two just speak to the gathering phase in a, in a small town? How, how did you begin to gather? And I guess I'd ask you to first, 
you're, you're from that area. You'd left for many years. Uh, you moved back. Um, how long were you there before you actually felt uh, called to plant the church or started planting the church? It was probably um, a year to a year and a half. And, but we, we needed to be, uh, we needed to pull away from a, a couple churches we had tried and really lay it down so that no one felt like we were um, taking any of their members. And so we rested for six months and just, uh, worshipped as a family in our home, and then it just started with, actually, it was one of my brothers and just a few friends just called us literally and said, well, what are you guys doing on Sunday morning? And we said, we're just worshiping at our house, and they literally asked if we could, if they could join us, and so that that is how we actually started, and then every Sunday, it seemed like someone else asked, you know, found out about it and piggybacked on it. Um, but how did we gather? Yeah, well, it's like I was mentioning before is, um, you know, I worked in a local business that a lot of people came through the business. And of course, I had the liberty to show the Lord with them. Um, so that was one of our main gathering points. Um, our kids were actually a huge part as well because yeah. they were involved in the school and um it, in fact our first convert uh was uh our daughter was in middle school and she invited one of her friends to our house and uh, i was able to teach my daughter how to lead her friend to christ and so that was one of our first converts um you know so through our children uh, our children were gatherers. We we just we uh, we just felt like you know hey you know we need to you know share Jesus with people out there and um, so um, so uh, you know one of it was definitely our location. I I can't emphasize enough that we literally moved onto the school road where everyone every single day back and forth all day long we're going to be going past our house. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have four kids and one of them with disabilities, you know, walking to and from school, it, it was just pretty obvious that, um, and then at night they'd go by and they could see cars outside. And um, I don't know. Um, that. You know, so location, I would really recommend that, you know, and Ross is such an introvert that he couldn't maintain that position of staying um, so public for a long time, but until we got off the ground, so we stayed there four years, and and so then once the, the, once the city felt really safe with who we were, then it wasn't about us anymore. Mm. It, Came so much more about the congregation as a whole, and then we could move off of that street and uh, get some privacy back in our life. So, couple follow-up questions uh, to that, um, Mary. Would you say is that part of the deal in small town that you have to have your life be completely public? Is that is that part of the? I think so. Yeah. There. They're looking for, are you the real deal? And much more, no one in Elgin, I don't think, would have known if we paid our bills, if we shopped local, if we... Um, cared about the community. Cared about the community. I mean, literally, the proverb that says, when good people bless a city, it prospers. Sure. Like, that's the heart and soul of who we are. We believe that. And we believe that our church can bless this city and make a difference. And so you got to get that in your bones that you're out to do this city well. And, and then find out what do they need. And, and so I guess we just love that. And, and so to me, it's, it's walking, um, you know, um, 
it's choosing to to shop local. It's choosing to get the names of all the cashiers at the local grocery store and, um, you know, just doing your acts of kindness right in that town and trying, you know, believing you're making a difference and knowing from the scripture that you are, you know, you're making an impact. Now, my guess is, is you still have boundaries for your, for your life, for your family to some degree, don't you? Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, totally. Yeah. We, um, well, ever since we started having kids and, you know, we're in the ministry when we started having kids and, uh, but we pretty much made a hard, fast rule that we will have a family night, you know, every week we had a family night, you know, and that was our sacred night as a family and the kids knew that and we'd play games together and stuff like that and then the other thing too is um you know ever since we had our kids we took them along with them um we took excuse me took them along with us uh in the ministry um i take my kids to the hospital and even when they're little and and showed them how to lay hands on people and pray for people and so you know that was um, something they, that the community could see that our family was doing this, you yeah. know, yeah. which it wasn't just the pastor, which is in your other churches. It's kind of like, well, clergy dominated and, you know, it didn't really matter what the wife did or the kids did or anything like that. We, we did it as a family. And I think that was really refreshing for a small town. Edith Schaefer, Joel says that, you know, every pastor's house has to have not only a door that opens, but a door that has hinges and a lock. And um, for us, when our kids were little, um, we had to have three to four nights a week that we were a family. And where this is the foundation of our faith is we're going to support each other. We're going to uh, believe in each other. And, and our devotions were always a part of our family. And so even though it might sound like we were um, busy, our family was our first mission field all the time, you know? Sure. So. A um, couple more follow-up questions. One that, that I had, one that's coming here through the uh, Q&A. Um, you're, you're, you're coaching other church planters. You are um, – you got a residency thing going now. You've got a couple uh, potential church planting sites going, or you know, uh, potential places to go. Um, how have you talked to them about gathering? How have you? Um, you guys were from Tomahawk. You have family there. You had a grocery store that's built in. You know, um, mm -hmm. how are you talking to those folks about gathering in the towns mm -hmm. they're looking at planting in? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that, of course, I um, learned this way back when, um, is you um, need to figure out what your networks are and mine those networks. Um, so, uh, like, for instance, with, uh, uh, you know, Pat and Jenny uh, possibly going to Point, uh, you know, he has a network within his business uh, that it's associated with. If he's a golfer, there's that's a network. Um, if uh, he volunteers uh, at the food pantry, there's another network. Uh, what we what we did in Tomahawk, I I picked out three networks that I was going to mind, and we stuck to those. Um, and so we weren't um, everything to everybody. You know, like Paul says, you know, be everything to everybody, but we we focused on three specific networks and that's where you did your gathering out of does that make sense and you know it 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 um uh it doesn't matter whether you're introvert or extrovert it's just those areas that you have a passion about and you care about those people in each of those groupings and and god will raise up people in each of those networks that you can um, share the gospel with disciple them and they become a part of your church so that's what i would recommend yeah. And so he would tie in his time with, with his children with hockey, and hockey was one of the areas he would mine is all the hockey families. But it was also in the context that 
he was teaching his son how to play hockey and he was spending time with his son. So yeah. it flowed together with also being a dad. Joel, you're not coming through. Thank you. I muted myself earlier. Sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, have you ever had any time where you have um, had the Hatfields and McCoys? Uh, one of the participants has sent this question oh. to me. Have you ever had that happen in your church where you've had, uh, because of small towns and there can be factions in small towns? <laughs> never had that. Yeah. <laughs> We got the Hatfields in the <laughs> and, and how how did you deal with that? Well, yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. You know, I guess someone said to us not maybe ten years ago. Someone said, if if the Hatfields have been in ten different churches and have had ten different pastors. What makes you think that you're going to be able to keep this Hatfield family? And what makes you think you're so powerful that if all the other pastors fail them, what makes you think you're going to be able to keep them? Yeah. And so one of the things is being able to laugh at yourself and say, I'm not that powerful. And so even though this family thinks that, they're God's gift to this church. Um, there's a good chance they'll probably be frustrated with us in a short amount of time. And so to really not hold on tightly to those people. And um, have you had to have direct conversations, like especially if if a faction was sucking the life out of the church, have you had to have direct conversations and um, ask them to leave, or what have you done there? Yes, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is being recorded, so yes. that feels uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. very good. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah no, so, they're beautiful people, uh, and, and, and it's like uh, here's what I here's what we tell people is is that um, we don't put handles on people. I, I think that's one of the refreshing things that the way we approach church, uh, I mean, we have membership and that sort of thing, but we tell people that you might be with us for this segment of your spiritual journey. And then the Lord might direct you to some other place and to some other ministry or whatever. But as long as you're here with us, you know, we really appreciate it if you cooperate, you know, with the vision and the leadership of the church and let's just move this thing forward. Let's create a healthy culture and let's move it forward. But, um, but I purposely tell people that, you know, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, I'm not going to have my, my shepherd's hook around your neck and, you know, you can't go any other place. And so I give people the freedom, the liberty to, you know, yeah, hey, this is cool. I have the freedom uh, to be here. And, and if, if they need to move on, we bless them. Uh, and, and, and then they move on, you know, so. Mm -hmm. It's nine o'clock. I want to be cognizant of people's time, nine o'clock Eastern time. I want to be cognizant of people's time, but there were two really good questions that came in by Facebook that I know the participants are on this webinar and I want to make sure to answer their questions. So we're yeah. just going to go a couple minutes over if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, one question was, and I'm sure your, your town has uh, experienced this, that the context, uh, and I know in, in Ohio, this is huge right now is small towns are being eaten alive. Uh, by whatever the cheapest drug is. Right now, it's meth and heroin seem to be yeah. the big ones here. Um, yeah. you know, and it's dulling the pain of poverty or dulling the pain of whatever they've been through in their childhood or um, or just hopelessness, dulling the pain of hopelessness. Um, how, uh, how have you all met that challenge in, in small town? Have you met that challenge? What, what have you found effective in, in your context? Yeah. The most, uh, I mean, we've tried to celebrate recovery and uh, in that sort of thing here. Um, and um, in small town, you know, if you're going to do a celebrate recovery, especially at a larger scale, it takes a lot of horses to drive that thing. Plus, it's a real lengthy thing. Um, and what we found is if you do smaller groups with 
uh, shorter agendas, you know, like a 10 week thing and stuff like that and, and have it uh, more um, personal and that sort of thing that you get much more traction with uh, people who, um, you know, are dealing with various addictions. Um, and a case in point, we, uh, had this uh, guy who's at the, our homeless house in, in Tomahawk. He started coming uh, to uh, actually to my men's uh, small group, and there's only you know five of us in that group. And so uh, it just so happened that one of the other guys in the group was in recovery too. And so there was a relationship, you know, developed with that guy with someone else in recovery. Um, and then as a group, we helped that person along. In fact, you just gave testimony in church this past Sunday uh, about, you know, um, how we're holding him accountable and he's got a job now and, uh, uh, you know, he's walking the straight and narrow. Um, but it, it's not easy because um, even if you have Christ-centered recovery, uh, the percentage still is rather small in terms of success. But nonetheless... Mm-hmm. Um, you you want to give them the opportunity uh, to be able to respond to Jesus and uh, you know His trans uh, transforming power. So that's good. That's mm-hmm. good. One final question here before um, I do a couple of announcements. We wrap up. Um, uh, Brad had asked a question, and I thought it was good when we talked about it beforehand. That you know, anytime you're talking about contextualization and missiology and stuff, there's always a the idea of how far is is too far. Um, ha, have you ever felt like that? Uh, have you ever had times in, in small town, you know, ministry that you felt like we've altered the gospel too far? Or are there are there any lines that you've drawn that said no? This is this is what we stay to. Does that make sense? That yeah, you know, um, yeah, it we, I, we, we I, can be culturally relevant and perhaps compromise well, core beliefs. Yeah. And let me just respond to that with a story, okay? Um, uh, one of my sons worked for my brother in his business, and uh, there was a beer distributor who got his girlfriend pregnant, and so my son was saying, well, what are you going to do with the baby? And the guy says, what? He says, well, you know, aren't you going to, you know, like dedicate that little one to the Lord? And the guy says, well, let me talk to my girlfriend. And so uh, they decided to do that, and um, I was available to do the dedication. Uh, Now, neither one of these couples, they were married. Um, They had this little girl out of wedlock. And I says, I typically do dedications at people's homes um, just because I I attract a larger crowd of unbelievers at a home. And um, so I went out to this guy's place, had a tent set up, and they were partying hardy by the time I got there. And uh, so I went and did the dedication and... um, you know, just shared a little bit with a few other people there, ate some food, you know, and uh, took off. Well, six years later, that couple walked into our church. In fact, this just happened last year with their six-year-old daughter that I did the dedication. And they says, remember us? I'm going, no, I don't. Because <laughs> I only had one contact with them. And they just says, well, we're here, uh, you know, looking to straighten out our lives and we're looking for God and Actually, we're looking for someone to marry us. We're finally deciding to get married, and uh, can you accommodate us with that? And uh, shortly after that, uh, the young man came to Christ, and then about a month after that, she came to Christ. Um, they got married. They got water baptized, and uh, the, they're, they're in small groups. They're in small groups, and in fact, they're potential church planters. Um, you know, and so. You can't be afraid to step into their world. You don't compromise the gospel. I didn't compromise, you know, what I presented in terms of Jesus, you know, and, and dedicating that child to the Lord and the seriousness of that and the expectations around that. But I wasn't intimidated by the environment. I had to step into their arena and and, and Jesus. To and they knew people. no different. They, they, yeah, they, they don't know any different, you know, uh, people... They, all they know is party, you know, and, and it's like, okay, well, you have to step into their party, you know, uh, and not be afraid. So there's a story. Um, now, other churches will swear up and down that I compromise the gospel. I compromise dedication. Uh, you know, you just can't do that, you know, and I'm sitting there going nonsense, you know. Mm. 
Weddings the same way. We like to do them lakes, taverns, wherever, you know, because it's just the world they live in. Mm. That's great. That's great. Ronnie Garris is awesome. He liked that one. So, he, <laughs> <laughs> so Ronnie liked that story. Cool. Well, we appreciate uh, your time. Thank you for doing this and, uh, and uh, preparing for tonight, Ross and Mary. We all appreciate you all doing that. And uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Yeah, us. thanks for asking us, Bill. Yeah, these two are a, are a jewel to the vineyard. They they have lots to to offer, and uh, if you can ever get around uh, Ross and and Mary, they're the they're the real deal. Um, they are living this out and making disciples who make disciples and making a real big impact, not only in Tomahawk but uh, they uh, they stretch beyond that in the people they coach and shepherd and impact around uh, northern Wisconsin and and around the vineyard movement. So mm. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, run our mind folks, just a couple quick announcements uh, here. We do have uh, coming up. We have our uh, 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 partnership meeting on triads. We're going to be doing some training March 12th, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that's in San Luis Obispo, Central California. If you know any vineyard folks or anybody, any denomination, any group that's interested in planting in small town USA, we'd encourage you to, to have them join us there. They can find more information on our partnership page at multiplyvineyard.org or uh, they can contact Mike Fry, acerbugeye at yahoo.com. Uh, also our small town USA church planning conference and, and doing church in rural America conference May 19th through 21st with Phil Strout and uh, and then a bunch of practitioners, not not people who are into theory, but people who are actually doing it in small town USA will be there leading affinity groups and main sessions and be a great time. It's seventy five dollars. That includes all of Friday's meals and uh, Saturday morning's breakfast. And there'll be affinity groups happening during those meals so you can hang out uh, with different people and share life together and stories and, and encourage one another. So. Uh, the last one of these we did, we had a, close to 60 people from 11 different states all over America came to it. And uh, person after person left telling us that it was one of the first uh, church conferences and planting conferences they had been to where they actually uh, felt understood because it was designed for small town people. So uh, in the small town context, we hope you can make it there. And uh, I should note, too, I didn't get a slide made, but uh, we will uh, have our next webinar in March, and that'll be March 10th, and Michael Hool uh, will be sharing about triads, why to do triads, and how to do them. And he has put together a great little resource, a little paper on how to do that, and so he's going to be sharing that uh, with us, so we look forward uh, to that, and Ronnie Higuera is going to be interviewing him and, and they'll be dialoguing about that. So I hope you can join us. We'll send out an email and have more information on that. Cool. Well, uh, I want to thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Ross and Mary. Um, I don't think we have nope, no more questions. So we are good to go. So uh, everybody have a good evening and uh, thank you very much. We will Bye. see you. See you, Joel. We'll see you. Thank you. All right. Take care, buddy. You too, buddy. Thank you for doing this. Yep.